Hey, hello, I'm with Barkley. Um, so, uh, I guess the shock is always over there because they have a screen down. All right, anyway. Um, so there's basically uh, three different topics. They're not completely unrelated, but three different topics I wanted to talk about today. So one of them is, um, I guess you could say it, it's general knowledge about sensible things. What's the nature of general knowledge about sensible things according to Barclay? And you know, that has, Two parts, natural philosophy, which roughly speaking means science, right, or physics, uh, and other sciences, maybe, um, and mathematics. Right, so Barclay discusses these two cases separately. But they're both they both raise problems because they're about um, uh, not about knowing that there's something here now, which obviously we understand how Barkin thinks you know that, but about knowing like general truths. And then the second one, which as I said, is obviously related. Right. Um, yeah, you can see that. Oh, but anyway, that's not what I meant to write anyway. I meant to write infinite divisibility. Um, space. Right. Barclay's arguments against the infinite divisibility of space. Um, and uh, this is interesting because it, I mean, it's interesting because what Hume says about this is super interesting and it's good to compare it with what Barton says about it, basically. Um, and the last thing is the reputation of skepticism. Right, and Barclay says that like, um, one of the great advantages of his view is that it allows him to refute skepticism. So I want to look into how that how that reputation is supposed to work, um, and what what it is he actually refutes. Um, so okay, so to this one first. So the, um, the first thing I want to point out about this thing. Is it possible I already mentioned this when I was talking about Locke? I don't, I don't know. But the connection between empiricism and voluntarism. And if I did talk about it, I'm going to talk about it again. But, um, right, so like, um, um, And this, I, this is a connection. I mean, I guess from some point of view, it's relatively obvious. I, you know, I first, uh, but I first remember thinking about it. I read something about it in Charles Taylor. I think this is in his book, uh, Sources of the Self. Um, he also wrote some stuff about Canada, he's a Canadian philosopher. Maybe I should have assigned him the other one. But anyway, so. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's when I first like started thinking about this connection. So, right, empiricism, um, here's the relevant kind of empiricism. It's in part one, section 31 on page 34. Darkly says,
And he's after talking about a whole bunch of general pieces of natural knowledge, like that food nourishes, sleep refreshes, fire warms us, etc. Then he says, all this we know, not by discovering any necessary connection between our ideas, but only by the observation of the settled laws of nature. So that is when we when we think we have an explanation of these things and we understand them or we know they're going to happen, what we really have is um, a generalization. We've seen the same thing happen many times, and um, this one, this thing that's happening now, is an instance of that generalization, and that's the explanation of it. This is what uh, later on was called the covering law theory of explanation. I don't know when that description was invented, probably in the 20th century, but oops. Right, but so to explain something is simply to um, note that it's an instance of a pattern. Whereas, uh, um, so this is, an, this is a, an empiricist view of explanation, as opposed to a rationalist view of explanation, which would be that you explain something when you are able to see that logically speaking, it must be so. Um, uh, so you, uh, or anyway, I mean, I don't want to necessarily commit to whether that connection has to be logical, but it has to be visible and necessary as Locke puts it. Right, so like according to Locke, um, and then and then and I, you know, as I pointed out, this is a limit on Locke's empiricism. In this respect, he's more a uh, rationalist. That um, according to Locke, when one body pushes another, we have an explanation for uh, why the other body starts moving, um, not just in the sense that it's. The same thing we've had we've seen happen in lots of other cases, but in the sense that we can see the necessity. In our ideas, we see the necessity of solidity and its connection with motion by uh, uh, causation of motion by impulse. So I mean, um, Barclay is saying. Uh, we have explanations if all you mean by it is that we see that things are instances of general patterns. But again, this isn't Barclay's terminology, but it's, I, I think it's the right term for what he's, he's saying. Um, so uh, um, we have explanations if that's what you mean by explanation. But if you mean that stronger rationalist view of explanation, um, Barclay is going to say we don't have that. And I mean, in a way, he um, does believe that a true explanation would have to be that rationalist kind of explanation. So like, this is section 103 on page 63. He's talking about the um, um, explaining things by the principle of attraction, right? This section starts, the great mechanical principle now in vogue is attraction, right? So he's talking about the universal law of gravitation and attempts to explain other things by a similar principle. And the principle is supposed to be that um, um, it's somehow essential to bodies that they are attracted to each other. So, 
So, and, and right, so this is what he says about it. That a stone falls to the earth or the sea swells towards the moon makes some appear sufficiently explained thereby. But how are we enlightened by being told this is done by attraction? Is it that that word signifies the man? Okay, well, I don't know. I'm going to skip over some of what he's saying here. But um, again, the parts of steel we see cohere firmly together. And this also is accounted for by attraction. But in this, as in the other instances, I do not perceive that anything is signified but besides the effect itself. Right? So, so Marty is saying, like, well, we, if you ask, why does the stone fall to earth? And you say, because it's attracted to the earth. What you mean is the stone falls to the earth because heavy things have been observed to fall towards the earth. Um, so, and when you, you know, when you see that the parts of steel stick together, um, and you say it's because they're attracted to each other. You're saying that they stick together because parts of steel have been observed to stick together. Right? And that's why he says, I do not perceive that anything is signified besides the effect itself. Right now, I mean, if by an explanation you mean this, you are, it is just the effect. Right? When you say, I've explained why the stone falls to the earth, because it's an instance of a pattern of having things moving towards the earth. I mean, Barclay's whole discussion of this, he doesn't realize that Newton has changed the subject from velocity to acceleration. Um, that's part of, uh, that, uh, that shows up in several places. He doesn't know. So he, he thinks of, of forces as causing motion um, rather than as a causing acceleration. But in any case, so let's say this means the attraction towards the earth means they've been observed to move towards the earth. So, um, um, we say that we, we explain this by that, we just mean, we explain this individual instance of the effect by saying the, the quote unquote effect by saying that it's an individual instance of a more general effect. We're not talking about the cause at all. <laughs> so let me read the end of that. I do not perceive that anything is signified besides the effect itself, for as for the manner of the action whereby it is produced, or the cause which produces it, these are not so much as aimed at. So, um, um, so basically, like what empiricism means here is, for Barclay, is that um, the world of experience consists of things that don't explain each other, that don't cause or, or predict each other. They're inert, as he always says about ideas. They can't cause each other. I mean, I shouldn't say they don't predict each other, but they don't predict each other because we see any connection between them. Um, they, they predict each other only in the sense that um, if we rely on the same regularity continuing to hold that is held in the, held in the past, then we will know what to expect. Um, so, um, Um, but of course, but uh, the point of reading that last point, last part was to point out that he, he thinks something does explain. Right? What explains them is the divine will. So, um, you know, and because God is a spirit that is an active being, um, uh, not inert. His, his will can explain what happened. And um, the, the, that's the connection to what's called voluntarism. So like voluntarism basically is the doctrine that the divine will is prior to the divine instinct. 
Um, I mean, it's like, so it goes back to the Middle Ages, this debates about this, but like in this context, what it means is that um, um, you can't figure out what God wants by knowing the rules that God has to follow. The rules are all the effects of God's will in the first place. They're the effects rather than the causes of God's will, right? So it's like it's, God is not consulting some uh, rules about, or, you know, but that is um, maybe consulting is the wrong word. God is not like um, perceiving with an intellect what must happen. And then for that reason, adjusting his will to that or something like that. Um, Rather, if something must happen in a certain way, it's because God willed it that way. Right? And these two things go together because, um, like, on the one hand, if you believe this, then um, you're going to think that essentially everything that happens is a miracle. Um, so, uh, um, uh, so you can't see the necessity of anything happening in advance. So you have to wait and see what happens. Um, and that's empirical. Um, and on the other hand, as, as also Pointed out, like for Barclay, it goes the other way. Also, that the like empiricism means that, um, as Barclay understands it, that nothing in the world of experience accounts for anything else in the strong sense. So, if you think everything must have a cause, it has to be something outside the world of experience, something that is not an idea or like an idea from Barclay's point of view, and that at least is a slot which he fills with the divine will. So these things go together up to a point, this was Charles Taylor's point about this, that like, um, in other words, um, if you think of empiricism as like a fundamentally um, kind of like anti-religious, Right, if you think like between the empiricist and the rationalist, that like you would think the rationalists are the religious ones, and the empiricist ones believe in science, you know, or something like that. But in fact, at least to begin with, it's these two things go together. So, like the kind of um, more you build up the absolute arbitrary power of God, the more you'll be attracted to empiricism and vice versa. And then there comes a point, and we'll see this in Hume, where you say, hold on a second, what is this doing? <laughs> you just have to wait and see what happens. What do you mean, what, what difference does it make that it's, there's a quote unquote will at the time? Right? And then, so then at that point, empiricism associates itself with atheism, but that, like, that was like kind of a surprise. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, Um, and like in some ways, I think if you if you ask, I never last time really got down to the question of why Barclay thinks we should believe in his idealism. Um, but I, you know, I think it has to do with. But, so I think what I did say last time was that the difference between Locke and Barclay is actually pretty subtle. 
that you know Locke and Barclay both think that there's an external substance that causes ideas in our mind, and the ideas are what we immediately perceive. And based on the ideas, we infer something about the external substance. And you might almost think that the fact that Locke calls this substance the world and Barclay calls it God is just a verbal difference. But then I was claiming that it's the reason it's not just a verbal difference is because Locke believes in primary quality, right? That is because Locke believes that there's a, ne there's a visible necessary connection between some of our ideas. That's what um, allows us to say that our ideas resemble the object. And if our ideas resemble the object in, in the primary quality, then you know, just as our ideas are, you know, common different sizes and shapes and states of motion and they um, like bounce off each other or whatever. So now we know that something analogous is happening out here in the object. Um, so the object is um, um, a uh, is an unthinking extended substance. It's analogous to our ideas of um, corporate, like bodiness. Whereas Barclay says, there are no such connections. Since there are no such connections, um, the, um, we have to regard the substance that's behind that um, all our ideas as simple. Um, uh, and as acting arbitrarily. So we're thinking of it as a very powerful will. Um, so, um, um, <clears throat> And I think the reason Barclay um, thinks that this kind of necessary connection is absurd is that he thinks, um, I mean, so that what has to happen there is that there's something that is, doesn't cause something else. First of all, doesn't logically apply it. Otherwise this wouldn't be interesting, right? Like, the connection between one idea and the same idea again is not going to work there. That's the that's the first kind of agreement and disagreement of ideas, and it, we don't learn anything about bodies from that. Um, so uh, something that doesn't it doesn't logically imply something else, and it doesn't cause the other thing because it's not active. Um, so uh, Barclay thinks um, um, to say this necessarily follows from this when it isn't logically implied by it or caused by it makes no sense. So you can say it if you want, but it doesn't make any sense, right? Like you've just ruled out the kinds of necessity that could be involved here. Oh. Um, so I think you know that's why like the general principle is that an I an idea no nothing like an idea can ever resemble an actus being because um, um, to resemble an actus being it would have to um, it would have to have the kind of necessary relation that follows from activity from causing something like explaining it in a strong sense. Um, but then it wouldn't be an idea. So, um, right, are there questions about what I was just saying? It's kind of things I've been saying before, but I, I think they've always been hard to understand. So I don't know if saying them again helped or hurt. Yeah. Well, 
<laughs> I just, I guess I'm not clear on like what. So basically, the the distinction between Locke and Barclay is that for Barclay, something has like things have to things happen in a certain way, and they reveal something. But for Locke, it's that it's it's not that they happen. It's that one thing happens and then it affects something else and it, it is that effect that reveals well it's it's that one thing happens and you can tell without experience what follows from that one right so like um you know if i feel if i if i have a sensation of solidity I know that that what's between my hands will resist me putting my hands together. Um, and I know that if if it if it impinges on another body, then you know if it moves towards it, then either it will have to stop or the other body will have to move. Um, and I know those things not by experience, but because the idea is themselves have yeah I can, all I can do is keep quoting what Locke says about it they have a visible necessary connection just from seeing the idea you can see that one is connected to the other even though they don't contain each other that would be a logical connection and um Barclay is saying but I think Locke agrees that they don't literally cause each other that each idea is just an affection in our mind Um, you know, their cause is somewhere else. Locke and Barclay agree about that. Their cause is a substance. So um, a substance can act, but a mere mode or accident or affection of a substance can't act. It doesn't have powers. Remember that was remember that was Locke's art like tricky argument about freedom of the will, right? A power can't have another power. Substances have powers, right? So these things, which are mere affections of our mind, don't have powers. They're not active. Um, so, um, and yet, nevertheless, Locke is saying somehow, just from looking at them, you can see that one falls from another. And uh, like, again, I think, I mean, I don't know. It should help to think about the concrete examples, except the concrete examples are not very concrete. They're very abstract. So I don't know how much that helps, right? Because they're about things like figure presupposes extension or like, you know, communication of motion by impulse presupposes solidity. Um, they're, you know, they're these like, um, Locke says there's very few of them, but I think like there's enough of them to, um to deduce or he thinks there's enough of them that you can deduce mechanistic physics from them right so even though we know very little about substances um and uh, what you know their essence is and how they affect each other we do know something namely that if you regard them simply as bodies and then we know that what's essential for them is solidity and we know because solidity is connected to other things in this way, we know certain things about how they can interact, how they must interact. Um, and well, also like what structure they must have. Um, so, uh, I don't know, did any of that help? Yeah. Right, and that's all that is what Barclay says is absurd. And, you know, Hume is, Going to agree with Barclay. And I think more interestingly, Kant is going to agree with Barclay. Um, except that Kant is going to try to explain the, how, there can, how we can represent necessity in our experience, even though Barclay is right. Necessity can never be given by the senses. Yeah. Um, in the volume you drew there, yeah. Um, I guess that there's like in both Barclays and Locke's case, there's two ideas in the mind. Right? And 
Um, there's an unthinking analogous substance outside of that. Is that the case? Well, for, for Locke, there's an unthinking analogous yeah. substance. For Barclay, there's a thinking non analogous substance. Non analogous substance. Right, a spirit. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Right, and I mean, the, the, the truth is, I think Barclay and Locke also agree about spirits or mental substances that, right, at least I was arguing that, that Locke says pretty clearly that every power of a mind is a bare power. They don't have primary quality. So I think Barclay and Locke agree about that too. You know, what they disagree about is, um, uh, whether there's another kind of substance besides spirits and that, that does have primary qualities. So Locke says yes, and Barclay says no. Um, okay, so so in other words, I think this is, it, um, so it's supposed to be somehow uh, like self-evident that this is the only way that ideas can explain each other. Um, okay, so I mean, so what this means is that, uh, like, we have to regard natural laws. So, what are natural laws? So, again, like, I don't know if it's clear what I mean when I draw this line here, but you think, like, here's my mind. And there's ideas in it, and they follow a certain pattern. Like after one like this, there's one like this, and then that happens to one, and then that happens to the other. Um, and so uh, Barclay says um, this is an arbitrary convention. It's on a par with the rule that the subject comes before the verb in English. There's no reason it has to be that way. But um, but we wouldn't have a language if we didn't adopt some rules. Right? So Barclay says it's the same for God communicating with us. Um, we can't, we'll never see a necessity be behind the particular laws of nature that there are. We can't see it from the ideas themselves because they have no necessary connection with each other. And we can't see it from the divine will because the divine will doesn't have a structure that resembles our ideas. Um, so, um, um, uh, so that that you know, so so for if you ask why is there this law rather than some other law, um, it's not a good question. Um, I mean, I guess so. For human languages, there is a way you can ask that question, like a historical way of asking that. Right? Why do we have one rule and not another? Well, in Proto-Indo-European, blah, 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 right? Hello? Of course, in a defined language, there's no explanation like that either. I, there's sound I'm, I'm on video class. <laughs> um. um. Right, so for a divine language, there's no explanation like that either, right? And we can't say God adopted this world because he was in the habit of adopting this world when he created other worlds, this thing like that, right? So it's just, it's arbitrary. Um,
However, the fact that there are some rules signifies the goodness of the divine will. It signifies the goodness, wisdom, and constancy of the divine will, as Sparky often says. But I feel like those are almost the same thing. Right? Like, what it signifies that um, these ideas are useful for us in seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And so, um, it, you know, uh, and so we have to regard the will that's behind them as good. Um, now, I mean, if you remember what I said last time about words that signify spirits, when we talk about spirits, what that means, it's actually like um, the statement, the will that causes the, our ideas is good, is itself like more an expression of our, of our will, than it, it's not a description, right? Those words don't stand for ideas. So those I, those words, if I say them to myself, I'm talking about what attitude I should take. Um, if I say them to you, I'm perhaps trying to induce you to take the right attitude towards the world. Um, like to be grateful or something like that. <laughs> to excite a certain passion, right? Remember, that's one of the things Barthi says words are good for that don't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to express an idea for that to work. To excite a certain passion, right? To excite the passion of gratitude. That might be the function of that sentence. So, and, you know, I mean, of course, I keep drawing pictures like this, but one thing I said quickly in the end last time is that this diagram is, it is just like those words about spirits. Right? It can't work because there's something analogous about the spatial relationship on the one hand and the relationship between God and the world on the other hand, because there is no resemblance. So if this sign like somehow semantically signifies something about the relationship between God and the world, again, it can only do it because it expresses my will, attempts to influence your will, raise passions, etc. Stuff like that. Yeah. So when does the divine intellect come out? Like what role does that play? if there's no I I mean it's you know it's I I think uh um I mean, okay, so uh, like for us, the intellect is the power of perceiving ideas. If it's true, as I was arguing last time, that um, that smart people don't really think there are ideas in God's mind, then uh, then you would have to say that the divine intellect is not distinct from the divine will depends on the divine will. Um, and that would go along with, with this doctrine about God, right? That, you know, so, right, like as opposed to Leibniz, who says the like, divine intellect sh shows God what all the possible worlds are, and the divine will chooses the best one. Um, for Barclay, there's, there's no showing what all the possible worlds are, because there's no constraints that um, could be like perceived by an intellect, it's arbitrary. Um, so, uh, so, like, I mean, you may think that, but you might wonder, didn't I say I was going to talk about natural philosophy and mathematics, and here I'm just talking about theology, and not even that really, because it's this weird theology where the words don't express ideas, and 
I mean, that's actually not that weird for like sure theology. That, that happens a lot, but uh, but in any case, uh, um, I mean, like this is something I, I can't emphasize this enough. When you read philosophers talking about God and proving the existence of God and whatever, you have to be very careful to figure out what it is they're actually trying to prove, what they think the words mean. <laughs> um, because when you when you do understand it, it's often very surprising. <laughs> All right, so uh, in any case, um, well, so, but this does, this does have implications for the uses and legitimacy of natural science. Because it means that when we observe a regularity, it's evidence, so to speak, for the um, goodness that produces that regularity. Um, but we don't see anything good about the regularity itself, right? It's just that there's any regularity. That's the evidence of goodness. So, um, so it doesn't produce any argument for why um, we should expect to keep seeing the same thing. I mean, you might say, well, look, wait, if this regularity suddenly stopped, wouldn't that be a sign of evil? But um, only if it didn't turn out to be part of a more comprehensive, comprehensive regularity, right? So, like, um, if it, you know, if the next time we see this, but then afterwards we see this whole pattern repeating, over and over again. There'd still be a regularity, and that would be just as consistent with the goodness of God as the other one was. So again, like when we observe regularities that are useful for us, um, we, um, we learn or we, we uh, come to take the attitude that we express by saying the divine will is good um but we don't learn that we don't build up evidence that 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 particular regularity must continue did you have a question yeah um so you were saying that there was like an arbitrary just like there's an arbitrary nature of like a verb before an atom like there are certain like Rules from a mind operated nature. Was it? Well, these are the rules for how nature is. Right, yeah. yeah. And um, then there was like the fact that like they were also made for like the goodness. And so they're made out of goodness. And so we seek like for pleasure and pain. Isn't, wouldn't that like not make them arbitrary? Because they would have a specific order or reason for the way they are. Well, but it's, but, but again, it's not this particular regularity, but the fact that there is a regularity that makes it, right? So, um, you know, I mean, it's the same thing with language, right? Now, I mean, there is a further issue here. This has to do with things that Kant starts discussing in the third critique and whatever. Like, this regularity would do us no good if it were beyond human comprehension. Just as a language would, would, even if it had grammatical rules, would be no good for us if those grammatical rules were not um, ones that humans could, could use for whatever reason. Um, perhaps because they're too complicated, perhaps because we have an innate language module that determines how language, you know, whatever. But they, so, I mean, there is some limit on what kind of regularities would be useful for us, but. Uh, but within those limits, it doesn't matter which one it is. The point, the way it helps us gain pleasure and avoid pain is that, you know, um, um, since uh, like among the regularities are ones that allow us to do things, you know, that is, we will a certain effect and it happens. 
Yeah, right. That is meaning like I want my hand to move. And then the ideas that are my hand moving happen. <laughs> right. So like so so because of that, if I also like let's say this is pleasurable and this is something I can make happen, like this is my hand moving. Then after then that I can rely on this regularity to do this and get that. Um, right, so that's why Barclay says that rather than trying to guess at ever like bolder extensions of the regularities we have observed. Um, um, What we should do is number one, to like contemplate the goodness that has shown itself so far. I should have written down where he says this. This is what he says. What we should do is, oh, actually, I think I am going to read it. Yeah. So, um, so what we should do, what the use for a natural science for observation of regularities in nature is number one, to contemplate the goodness that has shown itself. And number two, practically to like rely on. So we, like, we don't have a reason to think that this one will continue, but we know that it was, um, um, provided for our good. And so what we ought to do is rely on. And if it doesn't continue, that will also turn out to be for our good, I guess, the idea, yeah. Um, it seems like the way he's framing things implies that there is like no really cause and effect of anything. It's just your will has an idea and then by your will have an idea of big action, kind of like asking God to like, can you let this happen, please? Yeah. yeah, I did describe it that way. Maybe I went too far. Um, I mean, I think this is a difficult point to understand. And it's actually gonna be important when you basically tune uh, uh, Okay, so so put it this way. So like a different way to describe it would be we do know the reason why some things happen in a in a strict rationalist sense. If by no you mean we have the principle on our own will that explains them. Um so like that that's there's that doesn't consist in having certain ideas. That would that couldn't explain them. But we know why it happened because we know how to do it. <laughs> um, so, and Barclay, at least most of the time, does talk that. So, it, that is, that it's, that, that when we will an action in the world or in our mind, which those are just two different kinds of ideas, right? So um, that's it, the difference between those sensations and imaginations that I was talking about before, right? So like when when we will an action in the world or in the mind, we uh, actually uh, we know why it happened because we are why it why it happened. That's that's the way we know. Um, so like, so if that's true, it's then it's, yeah, it's not really true that I, that I just know that I want my hand to move and then I experience it moving. I, I mean, although it's not exactly right to say I experience causing it to move either because causing it to move is not part of experience. It's not idea, it's, it's part of what I'm doing, <laughs> right? So, um, um, but sometimes maybe Barclay says, I mean, like, so for sure Barclay thinks that, because he says this straight out, if I talk to you or do something to you, that goes by way of God, 
right? Then it means like I have certain ideas that I cause in my own mind. And the aim of it is to cause certain ideas in your mind, but I can't do that directly. Um, but that, you know, that again seems to indicate that if, when it's within my own mind, I can do it. Yeah. So like Hume is going to have a lot of arguments against that. Um, like, for example, that when I want my hand to move, what happens first is not that my hand moves, but some other stuff happens in my brain that I don't even know about. So how can you say that I'm doing the hand moving and that's how, in the sense that sense I know why it happens. I didn't even know what it is that I quote unquote caused to happen. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll see that when we get to the end. Um, yeah, so I mean, that, that, that's good. I think maybe I, I went too far in making uh, Barclay sound more like Mal Brunch or something. Like that. I mean, by the way, Bar I, you know, I said before that Barclay is always arguing with Locke. I guess I should qualify that. On some topics, there are other people he's arguing with, like Mal Brunch is one of them. Newton obviously is one of them. Um, all right. So, anyway, um, um, So, so there are these two things like gratitude and trust or faith. Um, and those are like exhaust the importance of natural science. Um, it's for those two things. Um, and both of those things involve, um, right? So again, I call and I'm, I'm calling this kind of grammatical connection between ideas or syntactic significance of ideas. That other ideas follow them in order according to grammatical rules. Um, but uh, those two, so like when we notice regularities, we're, we're focusing on the syntax. But Barclay says the use for that is for understanding what they signify about their cause, which is outside of the language, namely the divine will. Um, and again, what it means to know something about the divine will is to have these states of our own will or passions or whatever, like gratitude and, and faith. So, um, so saying the use of natural science is to excite gratitude and faith, it you know is the is the same as saying the use of natural science is to um, um, uh, interpret the world as a sign of the divine level, right? And this is I'm going to read where he brings this all together. This is section one hundred nine on page sixty six. As in reading other books, a wise man will choose to fix his, oh, sorry, as in reading other books, a wise man will choose to fix his thoughts on the sense and apply it to use rather than lay them out in grammatical remarks on the language. So in perusing the volume of nature, it seems beneath the dignity of the mind to affect an exactness in reducing each particular phenomenon to general rules or showing how it follows from them. We should propose to ourselves nobler views, such as to recreate and exalt the mind with a prospect for beauty, order, extent, and variety of natural things. Hence, by proper, in, proper inferences, to enlarge our notions of the grandeur, wisdom, and beneficence of the creator. And lastly, to make the several parts of the creation, so far as in us lies, subservient to the ends they were designed for, God's glory and the sustentation and comfort of ourselves and fellow creatures. Right, so he's saying that like when people start to get interested in learning the laws of nature for their own sake and like conjecturing about how there might there might be bigger and even more you know complete regularities and whatever. Um, like so, for example saying that there might be universal gravitation. Um, that what that's like is 
that you're reading a book. And instead of thinking about what it tells you about the author's intention and applying it to practical uses, you're um, trying to discover some grand like grammatical patterns. Um, so this is his criticism of Newtonian science, basically. Um, you know, like again, he doesn't understand Newtonian science very well, I feel. Um, so like the examples he gives, like he says, the fixed stars certainly are not attracted to each other. He means like they're not all falling towards each other. The fixed stars means stars. Right, as opposed to planets, yeah. So they're like not all falling towards each other. Well, like if you realize how far away they are and what whatever, like of course you don't see them falling towards each other, but in fact they are accelerated. I mean, I guess like Newton didn't know that, so maybe it's fair. Barclay or Newton didn't know that, but they are accelerated, and you know what explains their acceleration is gravity. They're accelerating towards the center of the galaxy. Um, so, uh, and they, they oscillate above and below the plane of the galaxy. Right when they get up here, they, they're attracted back down here in the center. All right. So anyway, um, uh, but nevertheless, even if he doesn't understand it very well, I think, um, I don't know if that's his, I don't know if the things he doesn't understand are essential to his criticism or if he could like dress it up with a better understanding of what Newton is saying that would still work. Um, and similarly, in the case of mathematics, um, so like especially geometry. So I think. Most so remember, like Locke thinks that our knowledge in geometry, at least as far as I understand him, Locke thinks that our knowledge in geometry is explained by those same kind of invisible necessary connections that we were talking about before. So, you know, like when we argue that these these angles must add up to two right angles because this one is like this one and this one is like this one you know these three obviously all add up to three right angles so somewhere in there we're using principles that are um um not trifling they're not neurological consequences of a definition or something, but they are intuitively certain. Probably having to do with the way things can move in space. Um, right, so I think it again, it all comes down to solidity and impulse and whatever. Um, but anyway, without it getting into details, it's some of those necessary connections that Locke thinks explain our knowledge in geometry. Now, like to some extent, Barclay's alternative to that is to say that where Locke sees a necessary connection between distinct ideas, there aren't really distinct ideas, right? So that remember that like that's one of the cases where they argue about the possibility of abstraction about whether uh, or about the possibility of, of separating ideas. Right, like whether the primary qualities can be separated from each other and considered in isolation. So, like figure without extension, or extension without figure, or motion without figure, or whatever. Um, so, I mean, like when Locke discusses a principle like so, um, Figure supposes extension, and you can't have figure without extension. And so, for him, that's a that's one of his examples of primary ideas that have a visible necessary connection. For Berkeley, I think that's a, just an example of 
taking the same idea and looking at it two different ways. Because you can't separate the figure from the extension and ask whether they always go together or not. Um, they're inseparably connected. Um, but uh, so, I mean, that's true for certain things, but I think like most of what Locke thinks we know by demonstration in geometry, Barclay thinks of as merely approximate empirical regularity. So like they have to be merely approximate because like, so what is a right angle? So like, Right angle is when there's two lines and they meet at a vertex. And um, and if you draw any circle around the vertex, exactly one quarter of the circle will be between the two lines. It doesn't matter what the radius of the circle is. At least I think this is how Locke thinks about angles, but he thinks of angles as arcs of circles. Right? But I mean, but but the the fact that this the, the proportion of the circle between the two lines doesn't depend on distance is what allows us to talk about angles without asking what is the radius of the arc. Okay, but now suppose so like. Suppose these lengths, they have to be the same if it's a circle, are both one. What's this length? Well, it's pi over four. Now, remember, uh, I mean, I haven't gotten to like the arguments about this yet, but Barclay thinks that space is not infinitely divisible. So in this segment of length one, there's some number of smallest parts, call that M. Well, um, and in this arc, there have to be some number of smallest parts, call that M. So, um, N over M equals pi over four, right? But this isn't true for any natural numbers, N and M, because pi, over, pi is irrational. So, um, so how many, so how long will this actually be? It will never be exactly the right length, so to speak. And and what length it actually is is going to depend on the radius of the circle, right? Like how many? If there's m here, how many can I fit in here? And it's always going to be uh, a little bit less than it's supposed to be according to this formula. But how much less is going to depend on how big the circle is. Um, so there really is no such thing as a right angle according to Blatt. Um, so when we talk about, we ask whether these three angles add up to right a right angle or whatever, um, we're talking about something that couldn't in principle be precisely true. It's uh, always going to be approximately true, and like uh, at best, and and um, how true it's going to be is going to depend on the size of the figure. Yeah. Can you just explain again why it would never be exactly pi over four? Because again, pi is a pi is an irrational number, right? So that means that there's no two natural numbers such that one over the other equals pi. 
And obviously putting a four there doesn't change anything, right? But you could put a four up there. So uh, um, that is, if pi is irrational, so is pi over four. Um, so, um, so, so first of all, I think Barclay has to say that, and, and does say that these regularities are only approximates. Um, but, um, but moreover, I think he doesn't say this as clearly, but I think he thinks that moreover that they're empirical. Right? That, like, how do we know that this is approximately pi over four times this length? Well, um, by like, taking a measuring tape and wrapping it around a column, or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, so it means that, like, developing, uh, and again, what is an empirical regularity? It's an arbitrary rule of divine syntax. So it means that spending a lot of time proving lots of theorems in geometry is again like spending a lot of time worrying about the grammar instead of the sense of the book that you're reading. Um, and that's why uh, what Barclay says about this. This is uh, section 131 on page 76. Um, whatever is useful in geometry and promotes the benefit of human life does still remain firm and unshaken on our principles. That science considered as practical will rather receive advantage than any prejudice from what has been said. And similarly, um, he says that an interest in arithmetic, um, this is section 122 on page 72. Whence it follows, so he, he's just gone through explaining what numbers are. And numbers are signs that we've set up to like stand in as placeholders for things. And we like move them around according to rules we've worked out in such a way that I was explaining this to the apples last time. You know, we have certain rules for exchanging things for these symbols or counters or whatever, and we have rules of manipulating the counters. And we found that if we do those, if we follow those rules, at the end we can exchange the counters back for things and we'll get the right answer. I think he thinks that even that is just empirical. I, I mean, I'm not sure, but he doesn't. He doesn't say anything to suggest other words. And, and, so, and so at the end of the, that description, he says, whence it follows that to study them that is numbers for their own sake would be just as wise as and, and to as good purpose as if a man neglecting the true use or original intention and subserviency of language should spend his time in impertinent criticisms upon words or reasons and controversies purely verbal. Right, so like arithmetic is just an arbitrary system of signs that's set up to try to mimic the arbitrary system of divine signs and to like get interested in it for its own sake um, is just missing the point. Um, 
So in the end, the conclusion about, you know, he says that I'm not gonna, I'm not saying anything to prejudice these scientists, but in but in the end, his his conclusion is that these sciences are fine as long as they're completely subservient to either practical uses or theological significance, but that pursued as their own ends, they're a waste of time. Um, and, you know, this is something, uh, it's part of a, it's, it's part of a reaction in philosophy to the rise of modern science. Um, this is, uh, I guess this is kind of an idea that there's this guy, Eric Schlieser. I've known him for a long time now. And it, like we kind of passed ideas back and forth. I think this is kind of my idea first, but then that he was the one who applied it to Berkeley. That, you know, so like modern science arises as a kind of like rival to philosophy. And not only a rival, but a rival that seems to work better. <laughs> and it seems to work better by not by doing what philosophers say you should do, right? Like not by being very careful to understand what it itself is, the like self knowledge, right? By just like forgetting about that, right? So, um, uh, so like even before the terminology, right? So at this time, Barclay is still calling it natural philosophy, right? It's so like our terminology of science versus philosophy hasn't worked out, hasn't um, you know, been uh, settled yet, but the, but the thing is already there. <laughs> and philosophers are worried about it, trying to understand how could this have happened? So, you know, like philosophers for centuries have been trying by the me only method that seems to make sense to understand the world, and it's been a failure. And now all of a sudden, <laughs> someone is doing it, and and like and Newton is the real crisis, right? Because that, like Newton it works so well, it's like nothing like uh, anything anyone has ever seen before. Um. So, uh, um, uh, so like, so, so philosophers have different reactions to that. And it, like at one extreme of the spectrum is Barclay's reaction, which is trying to try to claim that whatever in science is not philosophy is, uh, or not subservient to philosophy or practical uses of life is just um, um, empty. Useless, waste of time. Yeah, kind of a uh, not exactly a very like. Uh, never mind. Um, so what I was wondering is why doesn't he see the like understanding the world as like the like useful or practical or like what's the like what's the issue for him here? Well, so it depends what you mean by understanding the world. Remember, when I was talking about explanation, I could have been talking about understanding, right? Like understanding the world is knowing the explanation of the things that happen in the world. And he, you know, and again, he thinks in like in the true sense of that, understanding the world, nothing is more important. Understanding what the world signifies, namely the divine will, right? But in this other sense of understanding the world. Where understanding the world means seeing something that happens in the world and noting that it's an instance of a larger regularity it says no, that's not interesting, except when it's so far as it's useful. Um, um, okay, so uh, are there more questions about that? Because I'm going to go on to discuss the infinite divisibility of space, which is a somewhat separate. Um, okay, there is this research.
Um, okay, so is there divisibility of space? So, um, it's the best way to start with this. Just the way I've done it before. Right. So, Bart, I mean, To claim that space is not infinitely divisible is to set yourself up on a collision course with geometry. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, uh, things that, I mean, you saw it in the case of what I was talking about with the circle, right? Like the very simple things will turn out to be false if space is not infinitely divisible. Um, and infinitely divisible actually in a pretty strong sense. I mean, well, I don't know, I shouldn't get into that because people in this period have to focus on that now. But um, so um, so Barclay's claim is so like so one way to approach that would be to say, yeah, those conclusions are false because mathematicians just did their demonstrations wrong. That's not very plausible, especially um, this is something much later. Uh, David Lewis, uh, prominent late 20th century philosopher, uh, um, talking about the relationship between um, philosophy and science says, you know, um, like, it's not my place to uh, criticize science. If I come and say, you know, I have this philosophical argument, that you're wrong, they'll be like, um, and actually he alludes to Barclay in this case, I think. It's like, they'll be like, oh, you mean like those other great arguments you have, like the world doesn't exist and <laughs> Right, so he concludes, you know, concludes by saying that like the truths of science and mathematics are ever so much more certain than the result of any philosophical argument. <laughs> um, so, like, I mean, you're putting yourself in a bad position if you're going to say like my philosophical argument is uh, completely airtight and not like those sloppy geometrical arguments. <laughs> Um, I actually, if I, I don't think I've said this, well, this book. I have this fear that as I get older, I'm going to start telling the same stories over and over in the same course. <laughs> but I don't, because there's some stories I really love, but I don't think I've told this story in this course. That um, I asked a friend of mine who's a mathematician, um, does a mathematician ever publish a paper just to show that there's a problem in someone else's proof? And he said, well, no, I mean, if you find a problem in the proof, you contact the journal and they contact the author and the author either fixes the proof or issues a retraction. <laughs> right? So, you know, right there, you can see that the most rigorous seeming philosophical arguments are nothing like mathematical arguments, right? I mean, there's nothing in philosophy journals, but papers putting out problems that other people produce. <laughs> so, uh, right. So um, so anyway, so like I think you know for that reason Barclay doesn't want to say that that's why they got false conclusions. And instead he says there's valid conclusions, but their premises are false. And he says the premises that are false are not the mathematical principles. Because the mathematicians are too smart to accept false mathematical principles. The premises that are false are tacit false metaphysical principles. So the mathematicians, um, this is the way he puts it. This is section 118 on page 70. Um, Um, 
Yeah, here we go. Mathematicians, though they deduce their theorems from a great height of evidence, yet their first principles are limited by the consideration of quantity. And they do not ascend into any inquiry concerning those transcendental maxims which influence all the particular sciences. Right, so this is a little piece of, of like technical Aristotelian terminology. I'm not sure exactly how, how serious Barclay is about it, but you know, he's saying like quantity is one of the categories, one of Aristotle's 10 categories. A transcendental truth would be a truth that um, applies to things no matter what category they're in. That's, I think, is based on the way he's using the terminology. And he's saying the mathematicians start within the category of quantity. They never investigate those higher transcendental principles. So, so it's basically what I was saying. They, they start with mathematical principles. They don't ever investigate metaphysical principles. And of course, what are the false metaphysical principles? Well, you know, um, um, it's going to be abstract ideas and the existence of corporeal substance. <laughs> right, the existence of bodies outside the model. The same false principles that everyone has accepted. Mathematicians, although they're really good within their realm, are no better than anyone else when it comes to those false principles. Um, and in particular, the infinite divisibility of finite extension is supposed to be. Uh, Um, consequence of those false metaphysical principles. So, I mean, Barclay actually says that this doesn't seem exactly right or it needs some interpretation. It says the infinite divisibility of finite extension though it is not expressly laid down either as an axiom or theorem in the elements of that science, yet is throughout the same everywhere supposed. So it's not really, I mean, you could, you could certainly prove that you can bisect any line. Um, and moreover, well, I mean, you could the thing with the circle. That's 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 much more difficult to prove. But like, um, if this is a square of side one, um, it's pretty easy to prove that the length of this side is not in any natural number ratio. It, um, the the length of side this side isn't any rational number of these units. I mean, you know, like first you prove that that this is L, that one squared plus one squared equals L squared. That's, you know, I think I drew this picture before from the Mino. That's that's pretty easy to, to prove. And then, you know, uh, um, so, uh, like L squared, that, that, so L squared equals two. And then uh, it's it's pretty easy to prove just from um, like simple arguments about fact, the prime factorization of L, that, uh, that L can't be a rational number. Um, so, you know, so I guess the prime factorization of you know M and M, if that's right. There can't be any such M and M. Um, it's you know, it's it's basically because if M squared equals two M squared, then there's like an even number of twos in the prime factorization on this side. And there's an odd number in the prime factorization on that side. So they can't be equal. But I give you the fall back, never mind. So the point is, 
So, so like uh, Euclid proves that it's not that hard to prove that, that this can't be a rational number. And if this is not a rational number, then again, no matter what units I use to measure this side, there, um, I won't be able to use that same unit to measure this side exactly. And so uh, if this side is like exactly what we call the square root of two, right? Which is just a fancy way of saying L squared equals two. Right? <laughs> if this side is, has a length that we call square root of two, then it means that this line has pieces that are smaller than any unit. Right, because there's always some, no matter what units you use here, there's always going to be something left over that you can, yeah, right. So, I mean, so you can prove it, but I think, um, um, Barclay's response is that, um, What we actually prove, what the demonstration actually shows is that um, the bigger you make this figure, the closer it will be, the closer the Pythagorean theorem will be to being correct, given certain axioms. And I think that, I think, again, thinks the axioms are empirical. Right, that we just find that these axioms are are true. That is approximately true, and you know, and the reason. So, um, the reason we misunderstand that and think that we prove that this is exactly true, no matter what the size of the square is, is that we don't understand how this diagram signifies space squares in general. Right, so we think that um, two things. We think that this diagram is an abstract diagram that stands for any square, and we also think that um, the fact that we can't distinguish an infinite number of different parts in our idea of this line doesn't. Say anything about whether the line itself has an infinite number. Because the line of itself, the line itself is outside our mind. Right? So those those are the two false principles at work. Whereas um, in real life, uh, we're always reasoning about some particular idea, a particular line that we have in our mind. And then if you ask, but wait, Barclay, how then can we get a general conclusion? Because the answer is that we're using that particular line as a sign of lines in general, a syntactic sign, right? So we're using it according to certain rules where we find, and again, I think it's we find by experience. We find by experience that if you follow those rules, you can exchange this line for any line. When you're done, and your whatever answer you got will be approximately true in that case too. So, um, right. So that explains why. So, so you know, and so the smallest pieces we can distinguish here, the minimum visible, or the minima visible, I guess. The plural. Um, minimum of the visible. Well, I don't know. Anyway, so these these smallest pieces we can distinguish with our senses are actually all the pieces that the line that we're thinking about has. Because the line that we're thinking about is our thought, right? Like the line we're imagining is the line. Um, it's neither some, it, 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 there's neither lines outside the mind, nor is this a kind of line that doesn't even have a particular size because it stands for lines in general. 
No, it's a particular line at the particular size. That means a particular number of smallest parts put together in this straight way, whatever that is. He was going to say we have no idea what that is, actually. but never mind that. Put together in this straight way, and um, and we've learned that you know if you don't refer to certain facts about this line in the course of your demonstration. Um, which is just amounts to rules for how you're allowed to manipulate it. Right, I mean, it's similar to the idea, like suppose I exchange this apple for this mark and I exchange this apple for this mark. So like it's part of the rules for manipulating these symbols going forward that it doesn't matter how long they are. If I start referring to the length of it, then I'm not doing arithmetic anymore. Right? So it's the same thing here, only more complicated. But the point is so, you know, so when Barclay says, um, like, how do we make this conclusion of a proof general? It's because no mention is made in the proof of the length of the line or whatever. That's like literally because. We haven't put in the sentence that says the line is this long. <laughs> um, we've learned by experience that if you do that, you get results that apply to lines in general, approximately. Um, and so Barclay says, this is a big advantage, right? Remember, he said that not only is well, it, is it not to the prejudice of this science, but by I'm almost out of time. I better get to the thing about skepticism. But I'll just say, so Barclay claims that this is going to make geometry much easier. And it's not really, I think that shows a lack of experience with geometry. <laughs> it's not, it's not it's going to make geometry much harder. But anyway. He says, you know, it's similar to, I don't even know if this story is true, that supposedly some state legislature somewhere passed a law saying that pi would be equal to three from now on. <laughs> they thought that would make math easier. <laughs> it would not make math easier. All right. So, um, all right. So, but I just uh, should have better check of time. Um, Okay, so I'll just, right, so when Barclay discusses skepticism, he has a whole history of it. And the history is basically that um, when people started to think that their ideas were one thing and the object's idea were something else, then they started to doubt whether the objects were actually there. Um, and so he says, like, my system, by eliminating that gap, will refute skepticism. Right? Like, you know, so, like, according to Locke or Descartes, the problem is, I have an, I'm certain I have an idea of an apple, but I don't know if there's really an apple. And Barclay will say, well, that idea of the apple is the apple. So you are sure you think really an apple. The thing is, though, that, you know, uh, so in Descartes' meditations, the distinction between ideas and their objects comes, the distinction between ideas and their objects actually comes after the cogito argument. I'm going to be teaching 100 feet next year for the first time in years. That's going to be fun. But anyway, uh, like in the first meditation, Descartes doesn't use that terminology at all. There's no argument in the first meditation that's like, well, my sensations exist, but do their objects exist? What kind of argument is there instead? Well, the argument basically, and this is the nature of like actual, like ancient skeptical arguments that Descartes is uh, explicitly basing himself on, right? He says that in the discourse. So the argument is that um, um, 
the information I get from the census is not consistent. Like, for example, I mean, this example is actually comes up in the sixth meditation, but I think it's the kind of thing he's thinking about in the second meditation. So there's like a tower that when you're, I just forget which way it goes, but I think when you're far away, it looks round, and then when you get, no, I don't remember. Anyway, let's say it's when you're far away, it looks round, and then when you get closer, it looks square. Right, so Locke says, I mean, Descartes says, I can't trust my senses because if I trust my senses that there's a round tower, then they have to be wrong when they tell me there's a square tower and vice versa. So they, it's not impossible to trust them. And like, this is the way the, the arguments in the first meditation work in general. They're supposed to show that my old customary beliefs are not consistent with each other. So what is Barclay going to say about this? Well, so Barclay's going to say there is no contradiction there. There's this, this idea is a, is a round tower. This idea is a square tower. And there's a rule according to which one of them is connected to the other, a syntactic rule. Um, is that a reputation of skepticism? I mean, it depends what you thought you were doubting. But um, if what I was wondering is whether there's a tower there. And this goes back to what I said in the first lecture. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going over. I'll just finish this, this talk quickly. This goes back to what I said in the first lecture about Barclay, or no, maybe it was last time, that things are not really just a combination of ideas that I get all at the same time. Rather, a thing is like a rule for how ideas are supposed to follow each other. So that if the apple looks like an apple, but then I put my hand right through it, it wasn't an apple. And the same thing is true here, right? That like if um, when I get closer to the tower, it um, disappears or looks like a giraffe or turns upside down or whatever, right? Um, or if when I get closer, it looks square, but it still feels round or something like that, then I have to say, well, I don't know what was there, but it wasn't a tower. And so according to Barclay, why should you think that there's a tower as opposed to like all these like tower pieces that exist one after another? And the answer is because we're relying on divine regularity. So I think actually Barclay's reputation of skepticism is the same as Descartes, right? If the God is not a deceiver, that's, that's, why, that's why we should think there's a tower here. Okay, I'm sorry, I went over, so I'll stop there. Oh.